All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to True Crime Loser. I hope you're doing well. So, folks, I'm back from Turkey. Happy to be back in relaxing New York City. If your car is parked not in a parking spot, move it because when I come back in two minutes, it gets taken. Today, we're going to talk about grabbing the pen. Watch out, everybody. I'll do it. I'll do it. The first story I'm going to talk about came from a clip of footage that was uploaded to YouTube a week and a half ago. I'm sure a lot of you saw it, but I'll put it in the description. And it's a short clip, but it opens on a man named Reed Duran sitting in a quiet interrogation room in front of a table that only has one pen on it. Behind him is a uniformed cop just kind of sitting in there watching over him, waiting for the detective that's going to conduct the interrogation to come in. So Reed is just sitting there, the uniformed cops just sitting there, not much is going on. They're just waiting for the detective. But you can see the gears in Reed Duran's head turning as he looks at the pen like, I think I'm going to try to stab the cop in the neck with the pen. Yeah, that could be something. But before we talk about Reed Duran's failed attempt to stab the cop in the neck, let's talk very quickly about how did Reed Durant end up in the quiet interrogation room. And if you rewind an hour, we go to a kindergarten open house. So picture parents showing up with their little kindergartner. Hey, this is our little kindergartner walking around the classroom. Hey, look at that poster. That's nice. Meeting the teacher. The kids are playing. There's punch and water and coffee available if you want some. The grass is green, the bricks are red. It's an elementary school kindergarten open house. Doesn't get any more wholesome than that. Well, a couple of the parents and the principal noticed there was a strange man lurking around the open house. Does that guy have a kid here? Is that a parent? Who is that guy right there? The principal's noticing he was acting suspicious I picture that Reed Duran was cartoonishly tiptoeing around holding a bag that had candy written on it in crayon. And anytime someone looked at him, he quickly tried to hide behind a tree. But eventually the principal called the police and were like, yeah, there's a strange man. We're trying to do a kindergarten open house and there's some guy here. Can you guys come and check him out? He's suspicious. So the police come and go, hi, how are you? Come talk to us in the parking lot. So they're talking to Reed Duran in the parking lot and they're going, what are you doing here? Do you have a kid or something? Well, you're just lurking around, what are you doing? And apparently at first, Reed Duran had a bunch of nonsense stories that didn't make any sense. Yeah, I was here because this, but yeah. And they're going, no, no. And when he was pressed, on each of those stories go that doesn't make sense finally apparently he just admitted flat out i am here to abduct a five-year-old with tranquilizer laced candy in order to get sexual favors imagine the looks the cops gave each other you're getting these bs stories over no that's not and then all of a sudden that just comes out like yeah okay well would you mind coming downtown to talk to us a little bit more about that plan of yours? And he, Reed Duran, agrees. They bring him down to the station, put him in the interrogation room, say the detective will be down in a second. Just sit tight. Like I said, the uniform cops just do 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 do. Reed Duran makes the fateful decision. I'm going to do it. And let's pause right there. What? It's, it's hard to know. What is the best case scenario for going after the cop's neck with the pen. Other than a shirtless Navy SEAL in a Nancy Brophy novel, I don't think anyone's taken down the whole precinct with a pen. Whoa, woo, ha. Um, but maybe he wanted to try to just attack the cop and then get the cop's gun, or who knows? It was a terrible decision, obviously. But Reed Duran makes the fateful decision. He grabs the pen and with all of his force and minimal athletic ability, he goes full bore at the cop. The cop who is built 
more for uh, physical confrontation than Reed Durand is. He's got a fat neck. He looks like he can handle himself. He had great reaction time. He's young. He caught Reed Durand's arm, the one coming with the pen. He caught the arm just in time and got him on the shoulders and just muscled him, just big brothered him. The adrenaline that the cop had from the stabbing attempt, the cop stands up and the uh, Reed Durand flies back, lands in the corner on his face. By the time that Reed Durand is done falling, so he's still face down in the corner, the cop had already gotten his balance and is going forward now. He has time because of that to call. I need some backup in here. And he just easily mushes Duran into the corner, flattens him out. There's no, and you got to hats off to the, um, hats off to the cop because th th he didn't throw any extra shots. Like you idiot, you tried to stab me in the neck. You always see those horrible clips where the a policeman or a, like a corrections officer loses their temper. It's like, all right, well, that person has to be fired today. But this cop kept it professional. And if there was any time to just add an extra little elbow, this guy said he was going to abduct a five-year-old for sexual favors. And then he tried to stab you in the neck. If there was any time to lose your temper a little bit, give him a couple little elbows, that would be it. But the cop kept it professional. And just the most he said was, are you kidding me? And they brought, they brought Reed Duran out. So that was it for that one. There was no interrogation, or the, at least that we haven't seen. So for the rest of the video, we are going to talk about another pen grabber. I am going to, we're going to go over the interrogation, and I'm going to tell you the unspeakably sad and pathetic story of Jeff Stacy, the infamous to cut to catch a predator alum. He also grab the pen. I'll do it. Um, so let's talk about just like all the other To Catch a Predators, he ended up talking to Chris Hansen. Oh my god. Uh, but before that, he lived an hour away just like all the other To Catch a Predator dudes. He was talking to what he thought was a 15 year old. It was just some adult pretending to be one just like always. He does that the night before at midnight, and then they set up the meeting right for the next day. Like I said, he drives an hour. And what's crazy about these to catch a predators is, oh yeah, real quick update before we get into Jeff Stacy, Maurice Woolen, who I've done an episode on, who the sunglass spiker, the guy, I didn't do anything, but I did something dumb. He not a great update. Last year, hung himself. So, next time you're at a Mexican restaurant, pour a little margarita out, I guess, for him. But be careful. Don't tilt it too much too fast or the whole thing could slide out all at once. And as we all know, when if you accidentally pour out a whole margarita, it's in no way a good sign of things to come. But... Maurice Wollen is out of here. But anyway, let's get back to Jeff Stacy. So he chats with the decoy, just like all of them, drives an hour. And what's wild is he drove an hour, and I always picture them leaving on that drive. Just what kind of music were they listening to on the drive? The thoughts, I'm sure they get pretty graphic. I'm going to hang out with the 15-year-old. And what's so mind-blowing is it takes an hour to get there. From him leaving his house, within two hours, he's in a interrogation room begging the cops to kill him. Put a bullet in my head. Put a bullet in my head. He gets so dramatically suicidal. And they all know, because in the chats, they all say, are you a cop? We got to be careful. Don't. Are you sure you're not a cop? And so they all know it's a good chance it's a cop because how often does that situation really work out? Yeah, come over to my house tomorrow. They know the possibilities it's a cop. When he gets arrested, it goes exactly the way you would think. They mush him to the ground. They handcuff him. They read him his rights. They bring him to an interrogation room and they bring him to jail. So there's no surprises of what happens. And knowing 
within an hour and a half from his leaving his place, like, this is going to be amazing. You're in the police interrogation room. You knew that was a possibility, and yet they still go. It's like if you knew, in, if I do this, there's a good chance that I'm going to be suicide. In two hours, I'm going to be suicidal, want to die, going to jail, life over. I actually just don't think I'm going to do this thing right now because that's a big risk for two hours down the line. And they still get in their car. Wee! I'm going. It's unbelievable. So he shows up to the house. It's another thing I was thinking, those old to catch a predator houses. I wonder if the families that volunteered their house always talk about that. Like, remember that show, To Catch a Predator? We, they used our house. All of those creepy dudes were in our house. Pretty cool. Yeah, we took a trip down to Mexico and let them take over the house. But yeah, pretty cool. We're still in the same house. We love, we love the area. Good school districts. Uh, so Jeff Stacy shows up to the house, walks in. It's always too chilling. If I feel bad for him for an ounce, it's always chilling once they're actually in the house, walking around. Jeff Stacy's looking around. The decoy goes, wait for five minutes at the bar and then come up. And he goes, okay. And then, like always, Chris Hansen comes out and goes, can you sit over here? And... This is back when he was on one of the first chunks of the To Catch a Predator, so they do a really good job of making it vague. Like, who is Chris Hansen? Is this, the guys don't know, is this the cops? Or is this the girl's dad? Who is this? They don't really know. They're sitting there. Some of the great parts when he's talking to Chris Hansen is... Like all of them, he gets pressed on the chats. Like, you you asked her if she's a cop, if she sleeps naked, all this stuff. And he goes, I ask everyone that. And a couple different times, it makes a funny moment where either detectives or Chris Hansen go, you ask everyone if they're a cop and if they sleep naked. And he just goes, mm-hmm. That's the other thing, too, is Jeff Stacy which makes the whole just situation even more absurd. Jeff Stacy has pretty much the exact same voice as Mickey Mouse, especially when he starts to lie, it, get, it goes high, or when he's really getting pressed, or when he's trying to sound kind of pathetic, he can turn it on. But, I mean, we're never, Disney's never going to make a movie where Mickey Mouse is arrested and interrogated for possibly being a child molester, even though there is a lot of comic comedic potential there. So this is, people, this is as close as we're going to get is Jeff Stacy's interrogation so we got to enjoy it and then another funny part i thought in when he's talking to chris hansen there for 10 minutes you know he's denying i didn't know i'm sorry i didn't know she was underage and chris hansen goes you what you asked if she's a cop and jeff goes my druggy friends i have drug friends my druggy friends um, told me that if you ask, are you a cop, they have to answer you. So that's why I did it. And then I thought it was funny, maybe across town or at the police station, his druggy friend got caught for something and he's being interrogated. And they're like, How, why did you do this? And the druggy friend's going, my child molester friend told me if I did this, then that would happen. So they're both just saying, my druggy friend, my child molester friend also told me that. So he was blaming, blaming everything on his druggy friends. What else for the... Um, and then like most of them, that the part with Chris Hansen ends with Chris going, well, you know, what should happen to you? Or, you know, do you have anything else to say? And Jeff Stacy in his Mickey Mouse cartoon voice says, I'm sorry if all this happened. I'm sorry if all this... It's really a misunderstanding. I really did not intend on anything, really. That's an underrated Stacy line. That should be on his tombstone. Here lies Jeff Stacy. Quote, I really did not intend on anything, really. May he rest in peace. Uh, okay, so then 
Chris Hansen does the thing of, do you watch Dateline NBC? He says, no. Do you know what it is? No. Like I said, this is way back when it started. And it looks like the YouTube channel Law and Crime Network made a deal with Chris Hansen because they put a couple new, like, to catch a predator type. So the thing is still going. But Chris Hansen goes, all right, well, if you don't have anything else to say, you're free to go. So Jeff thinks that, okay, maybe I got out of this one. He walks out the door only to be violently pushed down, mushed down to be arrested by the, uh, by the law enforcement. And he now is metaphorically and literally face down. He just is laying there and he asks, one of the first things he asks is, can I just be shot? And they say no, as you can imagine. And they, um, so he's face down, they cuff him, and it's kind of funny, he's face down, and to read him his rights and stuff, the person on top of him picks him up, so he's like up like this, looking right at the detective, and the detective goes, do you have any mental problems or anything that would make you so, it, so you can't understand what I'm telling to you? And he kind of has like a drill sergeant type, and uh, Jeff Stacy goes, I have, ep he's about to say, I have epilepsy, and the detective just screams and interrupts him. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? And he goes, yeah. And he reads, he starts to read him his right. You have the right to remain silent. And again, Jeff just goes, can you sh just shoot me? And they read him his rights. They pick up Jeff Stacy, and they bring him to the interrogation room. And I don't think it's a normal interrogation room because they have to bring in the Dateline cameras, which, again, makes the whole thing feel so absurd. So they're in this room. It's wood-walled. It almost looks like the 70s. And, like, his interrogation has a 70s theme. Woo! And so they bring him in. The camera's in there, right in there. The guy with the boom mic, you can see it, like, dipping down every once in a while. So just imagine a detective reading the chat that you sent to the kid that's tough enough but having that big professional tv camera the whole time zooming in with the mic floating it's a wild it's definitely a wild situation to be in and so um for the first his interrogation takes 20 minutes about and the first 10 minutes he he thinks that there's a chance he's going home like they all do i think they think if they just say i'm sorry i didn't know they'll just get a a beating verbally you know you they're gonna everyone's gonna pretend like you're in big trouble but ultimately i think there's a part of him that thinks all right i'm still going home at the end of this they're just gonna kind of shake me up a little bit say that was wrong and then i'm out of here and so for the first 10 minutes Jeff Stacy's trying to stay with, I didn't know that she was underage. I wasn't going to do anything when I got there. Just talk. At one point he said, maybe just a kiss or two. Maybe just a kiss or two. Well, that's really frightening, Jeff, the way you said that. Just a kiss or two. But the vicious cycle that there's no reason to ever for these guys to do the interrogation because they have the chats and the fact that they showed up and so a lot of them make the right call and don't do it but i think jeff was just so his mind was racing so much that he didn't know he, he forgot that he could just say i'm not gonna sit down and take another beat down i just did it with chris hansen so he sits down and the detectives start with as you can imagine why did you come to the house what's your screen name because they want him to articulate everything and then when inevitably he goes well i didn't know she was 18 then you go well right here in the chat she says i'm 15 and then you said do you like older guys i love 15 year olds you're not a cop are you we got to be super careful because i'll get in huge trouble so as soon as they say i didn't know she was 18 you can easily go well yeah you did because if you didn't then you wouldn't have said are you a cop and this 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 and then inevitably it goes well i wasn't gonna do anything and it's like well that is interesting you say that because this whole stack of papers is everything you said you are gonna do and that you want to do and that you are gonna do 
well, that's just, and then inevitably it goes, well, that's just the internet. I just, I don't, I say whatever I want on the internet. The internet's not a real place. It's not like real world. I just, the internet is for just saying whatever comes to mind. And then you hit that with, well, that could be the case. But the fact that you showed up tonight and you walked into some crazy house an hour from where you live kind of proves that it's not just the internet because here you are. And then it goes, well, I didn't know she's 18. And it, so that's the, that's the circle, the never ending circle that these guys, the To Catch a Predator guys, go through if they try to do the interrogation. And takes about 10 minutes. They get him to say a lot of the stuff that they want to say. At one point they go, what kind of trouble are you in? And he goes, maybe jail, looking at him like, hmm, come on, please. And they go, no, 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 articulate it. And he goes, well, I showed up to solicit a minor. And the detective goes, for what? And Jeff Stacey goes, I guess, sex. And the detective goes, sex. And so for 10 minutes, Jeff Stacy tries to, uh, let me see if I got anything else, tries to make it, I didn't know, and then um, 10 minutes in, they got, they got him what he wanted to say, and he, so they finally go, all right, do you have any questions for us, Jeff? And Jeff ask the burning question that all of these men have from the moment the whole thing starts, which is, what's going to happen to me? And the detective comes in hard. He goes, you are going to go to jail. You are going to be charged with da-da-da-da-da. It's a felony. And Jeff's going, no, I didn't know. And he's, and one of my favorite parts of it, in the perfect Mickey Mouse voice. He goes, I'm not a child molester. And without missing a beat, the detective goes, well, evidently you were going to molest a child. And boom, Jeff Stacy's head goes down. And now we get into why his interrogation and his whole footage is, sets, it, it really sets himself apart from all the other ones. He's probably top three most infamous to catch a predator dudes and that's because he gets dramatically suicidal but all of his suicide threats really don't carry too much weight because you can actually see him say i'm gonna kill myself you put me in jail i'm gonna hang myself i'm gonna kill myself no i'm gonna do it i'm gonna kill myself and then he'll kind of go on for a bit and then look around like is, any, is it working? As if they're going to go, oh, he said he's suicidal. All right, you know that's a loophole. All right, let him go, Mr. Stacy. We're so sorry this happened tonight. We're going to get you on your way in your car. Get those handcuffs off the man. And so, and he just is over and over. And he actually gets pretty creative the amount of ways that he says it. So he says, I'm going to kill myself. I'm just going to shoot myself. Uh, he said, put it on TV. I don't care. I'll die before it hits the air. Kill myself and watch myself die. Put a bullet in my head. And he uses all of these a bunch of different times. And for a while, the first part of it is kind of like a conversational suicidal thoughts where he's going, I'm going to kill myself. And the detective's like, all right, listen, we're going to work this out. And he'll just go, no, I'm going to do it. You guys put me in jail. I'm going to hang myself. Just put a bullet in my head. And he actually even incriminates himself more because he just goes, I did something so wrong. I just want to die. I wanna, I'm going to kill myself. And after a while, the detectives, I just stop responding to him because there's only, only so many times that you can say, ah, you don't want to do that. And so once no one's responding to him anymore, he gets into more of a philosophical phase of his suicidal threats where no one's responding to him. And he's just kind of staring off in the space, just going, death. And, he, and his greatest line and probably his best contribution to the interrogation line history is he's just staring off into space. They're cuffing him up and he just goes, death. It's all that I have. It's all that I need. It's all that I want. It's like, it's kind of a good 
I'd be a good monologue for an actor to an audition for something. Like if I ever like go in the audition room, hi, my name's Scott, and today I'll be reading uh, the part for the gas station employee. I'll be reading a piece by Jeffrey Douglas Stacy entitled Death. Death. It's all I have. It's all I need. It's all that I want. Thank you. And then just walk out of the audition room whistling. <laughs> but pretty nice line. And what's funny is he says that, that line, death, it's all that I need. It's all that I have. It's all that I want. And at that moment, the detective is pulling keys out of his pocket. And he just has like set after keys after keys. And the detective goes, why do you have so many keys? And Jeff goes, doesn't matter. I'll be dead by tomorrow. And then it sets up these comical, probably the funniest part of it is they weren't done getting all of the information, just the, just the bare bones information you have to get from someone that's going through this process. But Jeff, on one hand, is totally checked out with his eyes glazed over making his suicide claims, but he's still comically... Um, He's still cooperating. So he'll be sitting there just going, put a bullet in my head. Death is all I need. And they're like, uh, Jeff, what's your area code? He goes, 516. I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to hang myself. Jeff, what's your phone number? Uh, <laughs> he like gives up. So it's this suicidal threats mixed in with a detective in a calm voice asking for the area code. It just sets up kind of a funny rhythm. And then he, you get to watch his whole intake and that the very, the intake is funny too because they're, you know, they're saying things like, all right, we're going to put your stuff in here. I'm not going to need it. I'll be dead. They're just like, okay. And one of the funniest parts of the intake is a lady goes, all right, Jeffrey, I got a dollar out of your personal property. I'm going to drop it in the safe, okay? And Jeff goes, okay, but I'm going to be dead. It's got to be irksome for the person that it's your job to keep the safe organized. You got to keep track of Jeff Stacy's dollar for a year. It's like not even worth the time and the effort to keep track of a dollar. Can we just, can someone just give Jeff a dollar at the end of this thing so we don't have to keep seeing this stupid dollar in the safe? Um, uh, so Jeff Stacy, then he, he, you know, he gets put in prison. He does one year in prison. He does 10 years on the sex offender registry. But hey, after that, Pretty recently, it looks like things were looking up. Jeff Stacy, a big update recently was he got married. Hey, look at that. Maybe, maybe he did his time. Maybe he changed. Maybe it's all looking sunny skies from here. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> and uh, last year, Jeff Stacy was found dead from a drug overdose morphine was in there i think some zanny the nanny was in there a couple other things was found dead and then his wife it's like well what's gonna happen to his wife you know got to look into that and there was an update recently for his wife which i was thinking she married possibly the one of the most famous child predators in the world at any given time those first few guys on te to catch a predator and he did the whole death it's all that i need it's all that i want first you marry that guy i picture her friends being like oh you're getting married that's so cool would would we know him from anything or would we have seen him anywhere and she's just like no nope nowhere but anyway, so the story, Jeff Stacy dies of the overdose, and then the wife gets an eviction notice on the townhouse that they were staying in, and before she gets evicted, she lights the townhouse on fire. And then a wild story from that is the day she lit it on fire, the people that share, that have like the apartment connected to theirs in the duplex, they weren't home, but their pets are. So imagine they come home, the fire department's there, there's 
black, you know, part of the building is all black from burns. They go, what is going on? And they tell her, yeah, you're, uh, there, there was a fire. You guys are going to have to, the building's not good structurally, so you're going to have to leave. So imagine that day you get home and you're, okay, the dogs are okay. Thank God we got to move out to a hotel. What a nightmare. We're stressed with life, and now we got to go stay at a hotel and probably move and the whole thing. And so the neighbor was getting everything, putting it on the kitchen table to get ready to move and probably stressed, and they're putting, like, the toiletries and medicine that the family takes on the kitchen table. And picture this scene. The neighbor's just sitting in there just probably stressed and deflated, like, I can't believe we have to move, I can't believe. And all of a sudden, Jeff Stacy's wife busts into the neighbor's apartment, runs up to the kitchen table, and tries to grab anything that even remotely looks like a prescription drug. Ah! Takes it all and then runs out. And the neighbor's probably just sitting there like, and so the neighbor, as you can imagine, was like, well, I'm going to go check on that. He just stole all of, stole the B12 vitamins. What is that crazy lady doing? And they walk out the door and over to the apartment that Jeff Stacy and the wife, which is now burned, and Jeff Stacy's wife is in there with all the prescription drug bottles sitting in the burned apartment in a plastic lawn chair, just sitting there. It's like... All right, and she got a, as you can imagine, a like three arson charges, not good, and she was sentenced to three years in a mental institution. So that's the story, folks. That's the big update. So happy to be back. I'll see you guys soon. Why? Stive and why? Shameda. <laughs>